Um, hi everyone, great to be here. I'm Stephanie Valencia and I am really excited to share with you this work uh, called COMPA, Using Conversation Context to Achieve Common Ground in AAC. And this is work uh, that I've done with my colleagues at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and now I'm very excited that this is my first HCIL symposium. So hopefully I'll share more work that we do here as well. So I work with people who use AAC devices or augmentative and alternative communication devices, which are specialized interfaces that generate speech um, through different input modes. So you can imagine uh, things like tablet-based touch screens where people type their words that they wanna then be synthesized to speech to share out loud. And so communicating with AAC devices really helps uh, people with speech disabilities or other disabilities, but it can be a little bit slow to communicate compared to verbal speech, uh, where we can just speak at really high rates while people are typing. And this creates different types of asymmetries. For example, picture this conversation between two non-AAC users, Jane and Alex, and Arlo, who is an AAC user, and let's say they're on a Zoom call. And so Jane says something like, hey, let's meet up in person to plan our summer vacation with the kids. And then uh, Alex says, I have a pretty book day, but I could catch up with you later. Then uh, Jane responds, yeah, should, uh, sounds good. Should we get coffee? Are you both free around 2 p.m.? And in that moment, Arlo, who's an AAC user and is not speaking verbally, starts to type their response. What happens is that people don't pick up on this cue and so that they just move on the conversation forward. And so Alex just responds, yeah, that works, Jane. How are the kids? And Jane responds, the kids are great. They're excited for this trip. And so we observe that there is a topic change, but Arlo finally has probably like a minute later, um, prepare their message and speaks it out loud and just says something like, yes. So if we didn't have the conversation transcript, we could understand that this yes might sound a little bit ambiguous, right? It could be like, yes, it's great. I'm affirming that the kids are doing great. I'm glad for you, Jane, right? But actually, because we know that Arlo started typing closer to uh, this time, when uh, Jane asked about if they were free for coffee, we could assume because we have all of this context that Arlo is referring to this. But in real uh, life conversations, we don't have access to all of this transcript information. And so uh, AC users often experience a lot of misunderstandings. What we do um, to avoid this is to add reference words, right? We could say something like yes to coffee or yes, I'd love to grab coffee with you. Where should we meet up? But that takes so much effort, physical effort and time effort for AAC users. So we went in to do two formative studies to understand, but through uh, conversation analysis and through participatory workshops, like what could we build to support this out of context problem, this time asymmetry challenge. And we learned through these studies that partners and devices can improve communication when both parties, so non-AAC users and AAC users, kind of have a shared conversational context to work from. And uh, we also learned through different uh, workshops that we carried out that partners really need and can benefit from signaling. So knowing when the AAC user is typing, when they want to speak. So we were finding the second design goal of let's provide more awareness. We also know that conversation relies on cooperation, right? It, it's very important. So uh, we focused on this third goal of supporting both AAC users and partners in um, talking with each other. And that's how we designed COMPA, which I'll walk through very fast. So COMPA is an add-on, like a, a Google Chrome browser extension that supports Google Meetings. And hopefully we can open it up for Zoom and more things. And what it provides is a communication partner interface to the right, where communication partners are alerted of when an AAC user wants to speak, when they're typing, what their intent is, and what part of the conversation they're speaking to. And on the AAC user side, the AAC user can um, gather different starter phrases from the specific context they select that automatically get selected when they start typing. 
And so they can get some suggestions from a large language model on some starter phrases that have reference words that can help them uh, refer to different past topics in conversation. And I'm gonna jump ahead really quickly through the features, but basically Compa freezes the conversation uh, marks the context of where this user wants to speak and allows them to select an intention that guides uh, the starter phrases that are generated by the model. Um, they also have a text composition panel where they can edit these phrases if they don't agree with them and they can play these phrases out loud in the conversation. And the communication partner really gets notified depending on the AC user's intent selections. So we tried this and we did an ablation study to compare the different features of COMPA and understand uh, how they impacted users' participation in conversation. And in a triadic uh, conversation, we were when we were all planning a summer vacation and where I, the researcher, was intentionally embedding a lot of topic changes, we noticed that people actually <laughs> seemed to level, that, that COMPA was positively received. And I'm out of time, but I am, would love to um, talk more with you about this. So thank you. I just want to be respectful of the time. <laughs> thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sierra Fabian, um, and today I will be talking about my thesis research, studying the effects of color within virtual reality on the psychological and physical behavior. The reason I conducted this study is because one day I hope to use the findings that I have found from the study to help build an application that would help those with anxiety and depression. So before I start, I want you to take a moment and think about these questions to yourself. What do colors mean to you personally? How do colors play a role in your everyday life? And how important are colors in everything we use? The focus of this research directly related to those questions. What emotions are associated with specific color groups and how colors affect us psychologically and physiologically? This is super important to know, as knowing how colors affect users will allow us to build impactful and effective applications using specified color palettes to achieve the desired effects we want to have on our users. For this study, there was two color groups, warm and cool colors. For the warm color groups, I used red, red-orange, orange, yellow-orange, and yellow. And for the cool colors, I used violet, blue-violet, blue, blue-green, blue and green. For this study, 20 participants were recruited and 10 were randomly assigned to grouped warm and 10 were randomly assigned to group cool. For the methods of measurements, there was heart rate taken, so measuring the changes of heart rate among the participants and the positive and negative effect schedule, which you'll also hear me call PANIS, which was a uh, in order, this, a scale to measure emotions, um, and it gave a set of 20 emotions, 10 positive and 10 negative, and had participants rate how they were feeling at that time from very slightly to extremely. For the color simulation that you can see here, the participants viewed their assigned color group within the virtual reality headset for about 10 minutes. And during this time, the participants had their heart rate being monitored and participants' heart rates were also monitored before and after uh, the simulation was shown to showcase any changes that had occurred. So for the findings, for the psychological findings, it was found that, that for the warm colors, uh, they were, Participants associated emotions that were associated with higher arousal and more negative valence, such as alert and valence, or alert and attentiveness. And for cool colors, it was showcased that 60% of participants actually rated emotions that were related with higher arousal and negative valence much, with much lower scores after viewing the cool colors. This means emotions such as alert, attentive, nervous were no longer felt as strongly once the cool simulation was shown to the participants. For the physiological data conclusions, it was found that 80% of participants actually experienced an increase in heart rate, either during or immediately after the showcasing of the warm colors. And in contrast, all 10 participants experienced a decrease in heart rate for the cool colors, either during or immediately after viewing cool colors. This also showcased how colors actually may have a long uh, effect um, even after the colors are showcased. So overall, 
I learned that cool colors have a less stimulating effect compared to warm colors. And in this study, it was found that cool colors decrease the output of the physiological data and the scores for the emotions that are more negative and stimulating were also rated much lower. And these results are in contrast with the warm colors where it was found that on average, the heart rates were uh, it would increase for the participants, and it was also found that warm colors would be associated with more emotions such as stress and high arousal, such as being alert. So how can these findings be used? Well, this work can be applied in a variety of different things. This work can be applied to focus on how user experience and applications and how they interact with the application based on the color palette being used. This knowledge is also allowed us to build designs that will create desired effects and emotional reactions that we want to have uh, on our users based on the color palettes that we choose. And since this research was done in VR, it can be applied back to the domain of immersive technology and understanding how colors affect us allow us to build impactful scenes in VR, such as using a blue and green VR Zen garden to create a calming effect. Overall, these findings are really important as knowing how colors affect our users will allow designers and developers to build long lasting applications that are impactful and, uh, and ethical, especially when it comes to having an effect on our users' physical and emotional reaction. I know this was quick, so if you have any questions, please feel free to email me or visit my website and contact me through there, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Mittal, and I just completed my master's in human computer interaction from the College of Information Studies. And this work is done in collaboration with Professor Amanda Lazar and Ripu uh, in, as part of the lab Health Aging Link Technology. Um, and in this study, we explored the interactive user manuals with three instructions to support older adults in operating makerspace tools. So as more and more older adults start using, using technology, it is important to not only study the adoption, but also study how to support them in learning these technologies. And makerspaces present opportunities for both supporting and shaping technology use of these um, older adults. Um, and this study is part of our ongoing collaboration with a resident-led makerspace in an independent living community, where we study different resources that can support older adults in using these technologies. And our previous studies revealed the need for exploring new technology dimension to effectively support the use of complex tools like 3D printer, make up for the lack of human assistance, and also possibly support more eff efficient learning compared to 2D instruction booklets or video tutorials. So based on this, we explored a new way of learning for older adults, which is through interactive user manual with 3D instruction. Um, as you can see on the right, the prototype had three main flows, introduction, learn, and troubleshooting. Uh, when you click on introduction, um, it shows you different examples of things that are possible to make with the tool to kind of motivate the users. Um, now going to the second part, which is learn 3D printer. It, it, it introduces different parts of the printer and like shows their location information accurately in 3D space. As you can see, it shows every part one by one and you can learn this like self-paced. Now the third part is troubleshooting the 3D printer. So whenever you encounter a problem with your tool, you can go here and it shows step-by-step -step proce process to troubleshoot the problem. So after this, um, our focus was to answer our question, how do older adults perceive learning through the interactive 3D manuals? And what kind of usability and design consideration can make this method more efficient for them? So to answer this question and gather initial feedback on such a new way of learning for older adults, we conducted prototyping testing sessions for four, with four older adults, and each of those sessions were followed by semi-structured interviews. And all of our recruited, recruited participants were usually involved in makerspace activities, and their age ranged from 70 to 79. Um, so I'll just talk about a few preliminary findings that we have. So first of all, uh, learning through 3D manuals was found easier. Uh, despite it being a more technological advance than 2D printed manuals and video tutorials, uh, as mentioned by one of our participants, it would generally take them longer to read the instruction booklet and do a task, but it was, the 3D manuals were much, much easier for them because it showed every single part and it was self-paced. Um, the second finding was that participants felt more confident to use makerspace tools. 
as mentioned by our participants, uh, they felt afraid to just read the instruction booklet and use the tool, but they felt much more confident after they went through the 3D manual. Now coming to some of the usability consideration, uh, some of our participants uh, suggested that you add a zoom button on the screen so that they can zoom in and zoom out of some of the parts of the tool. But some participants were uncomfortable with using the zoom feature. So they suggested that we have a bigger display of small parts on the side so they don't have to always zoom in. Now some participants had preference for audio instructions. So the, we can, for them, we can have a audio instruction toggle button on the screen so that they can hear instructions whenever they don't feel like reading the text. Now third is some participants uh, struggled with comprehending the long instruction sentences. So for them, we can use like better visual organization to support readability. Uh, some participants were uh, unfamiliar with the technical terms like ethernet and USB. So for them, we can have additional tooltip along with the instructions. Now, our next step would be to answer our question, does having an immersive environment with a real size 3D printer and a virtual makerspace environment make the learning more efficient? Uh, so to answer this question, we will conduct some prototype testing with a VR headset and then compare the learning efficiency between the desktop and VR headset interactions. Um, that's it. Uh, at last, I would thank our participants, community collaborators, and sponsors. Um, in case you have any questions, you can reach out to me on this email. Thank you. OK, so our research is on team meeting modes and disability. Uh, basically, the issue, team meeting modes. So COVID happened. Um, before, we were all face-to-face -face in our meetings, so we're all co-located in a room when we do meetings. Then we moved virtual um, because we weren't co-located anymore, but we were all on Zoom together. And now we have this weird situation where we're returning to work. So we have these co-located, um, these, these meetings where some of us are on Zoom and some of us are in the room. And you can think of this like the HCIL brown bags. We do stuff like this. And basically there's research that's coming out that's kind of putting this up for debate, like what's going on? Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? We're talking to people with disabilities about it because we think that their voice is not in this uh, discussion yet or not in there enough. Um, so basically the effects of meeting mode uh, is debated. There's arguments about cohesion and a lot of experts can say that this is mitigated through careful planning, um, but we are going to talk to the people themselves. So here's the space. Um, remote work has already been shown to be an accommodation for people with disabilities. Um, there's less information about hybrid, hybrid is newer, so there's not a lot out there right now. There's also less interaction about modality technology and disability, partly because the technology is also new. Things like meeting owls haven't been around for a long time for us to do that sort of research yet. So that's where we slide in. So the goals of this study, it's experiential and exploratory. We're trying to find the emic experiences of the people who have disabilities and how they uh, experience these meetings. So um, we're trying to understand challenges, opportunities, effects, not just the good, not just the bad, basically everything that's going on. To do this, we have 22 participants so far. This is ongoing till the end of the month. We'll be doing data collection. Um, we're looking at a variety of contexts and a variety of jobs as well, different sorts of tasks. Um, we're doing semi-structured interview protocol. And um, we're doing also critical incident prompts to ask about things that are specifically frustrating or specifically helpful for people. Um, technology uses, benefits, drawbacks, also pie in the sky, ideal world, what would you have your meetings like? And we broke this down into virtual meetings, face-to-face -face meetings, and hybrid meetings. So we ask about them by modality, so people kind of get to think about them all in one clump, what's good, what's bad about this situation. Uh, we're also currently in the middle of doing thematic analysis, a la Brahman Clark, on these transcripts, um, and we're doing an iterative coding process. And we wanted to get um, as broad a range of participants as we can. Um, we know a lot of HCI work looks at visual impairment and hard of hearing, but a lot of other people uh, remain kind of voiceless in this sort of research. So we are looking for possibility, not probability. So we're trying to get a wide range. Um, our initial findings, remote meetings are a key accommodation. That's still true. Um, what was kind of interesting is that hybrid meetings are better than physical generally for people, but they're the dispreferred option. Um, there's a lot of technology issues, there's incompatibility with things like accessibility software, um, there's a lot of AV failure across the board when it comes to remote and hybrid meetings, but more so in hybrid than remote, so it's super frustrating all the way across. 
There's also disability accommodations that are in direct conflict with each other, like people who are hard of hearing need to be able to read lips, but if you're masking because you're immunocompromised, they cannot read your lips. So these are the sort of thing where accessibility check-ins were brought up as things that can potentially help. Also, some people who need the caption crawl across the bottom, that'll cause pretty severe nausea in some of our participants. So again, we have conflicting needs here. Also, um, social and professional implications for remote meetings. A lot of people who show up, um, particularly remote in a hybrid setting, feel like they're a total outgroup. They're ignored. They feel like they're voiceless in their meetings. They can't hear. People can't hear them. They can't see. People can't see them. So they think, why did I even show up to this? This would have been better as an email. Things like that. And also many of the ideal meeting requests that our uh, participants had boil down to things that help everyone. So this is not a special interest group. This is not an issue that's like, oh, well, this is just for people with disabilities. That's a small part of the population. Not true. A lot of it boils down to things like planning, facilitation, agenda setting, turn taking, things that help everyone. Um, so our next steps, again, data collection through the end of May. Um, we are trying to do this to um, develop a national survey that is sort of like a, a born accessible survey because if our survey is not accessible, how do we get information from people with disabilities if they can't even take our survey? Um, so we're trying to be mindful of things like that. And um, we want to examine more than just the um, sort of like baseline what's good, what's bad. So we're using these qualitative interviews to inform the survey later. Um, also, we want to be able to do suggestions for um, workplace improvement based on these lived experiences, things like hybrid specific facilitator training, which is really important for people to not get completely forgotten in chat. Um, also, balancing different accommodation needs, making accessibility check-ins the standard instead of the rare thing that people say, this was great, we did it once and then never again. So that's our work. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, my name is Ray Puhu. I'm a PhD candidate in the College of Information Studies at University of Maryland. And today I'm presenting our work on exploring video conferencing for older adults with cognitive concerns using a dramaturgical lens. So past work has demonstrated the potential of video conferencing technology among general older adult population. Um, in ways to provide, you know, social support to deliver online health services. However, when older adults with cognitive concerns use video conferencing, they often face compounded challenges, including usability issue, communication barriers, and cognitive concerns when they appear up during the use of video conferencing. As our title suggests, we are using a dramaturgical lens to study video conferencing technology with a specific demographic. So I want to give it a little time to introduce this framework. Um, sociologist Irvin Goffman created this framework that compares certain social settings to a theatrical performance. So people are like actors performing on a stage and they presenting themselves in certain ways to create impressions. Just like me doing now, I'm performing on a stage and I'm managing how I speak, how I move my hand gestures to create a role. And this role might be a diligent graduate student or a professional HCI researcher. So past work in CSEW and HCI has used Goffman's framework to understand how people present themselves through mediated communication. Cognitive concerns such as short-term memory and language ability, ability loss may present unique impact that people must address during the use of video conferencing. Our motivation um, for working with Goffman's framework began with the aim to capture insights that were not oft, often seen in research, particularly around um, how do people manage other um, imp others' impressions of cognitive concerns, as well as what kind of work were involved in this process while using video conferencing. And um, using Irvin Goffman's work, we got to think about um, different kinds of work involved in putting forth this performance. You know, just like um, when I stand on this stage, someone had to set up the stage and I had to create the slides and practice this talk in advance. Therefore, in this project, we asked how Goffman's dramaturgical framework can be applied to study video conferencing technology use by older adults with cognitive concerns. To answer this question, we engaged 18 participants over the age of 65 
with a variety of cognitive concerns um, through technology discussion groups, semi-structured interviews, and observation sessions. And we are sharing part of the findings today. Um, through our analysis, we deconstructed participants' use of video conferencing into two segments based on Goffman's theatrical metaphors, and they are backstage and the front stage. In the backstage of performances, people usually engage in more private behaviors that are often invisible to the front stage. However, the work in the backstage is important and necessary to the more public front stage performance. And we found individuals engage in two kinds of work in the backstage. First, they would select devices that work for a better um, or smooth performance um, with consideration of the characters, char characteristics of the devices, such as size, portability, obsolescence. Um, they also employed tools such as emails and hand handwritten notes to uh, support the logistical aspect of performing a video conferencing. The front stage is where the performance is given to the audiences, just like me doing now to present the work to you. Participants found the audio and video channels afforded by video conferencing as important for giving these performances and communicating with others. To make this communication works, they need to engage in two kinds of work. First, um, oh, sorry. First, they ensure the communication channels were working through sounds and video check. And second, they aimed to set their backgrounds to convey certain impressions, you know, like a bookcase in the background. So we generate uh, insights into how deconstructing these elements can inform more meaningful and more accessible HC HCI design for future work. First, the backstage perspective suggests a new angle for more accessible video conferencing design to consider a larger scope of work, um, you know, like not traditionally seen in research, um, such, as, such as exploring the behind scenes work people engage in. And finally, addressing the challenges of presenting cognitive concerns, as well as managing other impressions during the video conference, conferencing use can use to support better communication. So I want to thank you to all the participants, sponsors, collaborators, and reviewers during this whole process for your amazing contribution. And my name's Ray Puhu. Um, thank you for your time again. Please come to our poster session for questions and discussions. Thank you. Greetings. I'm Zijian Jason Dean, a three-year PhD candidate working with Professor Zhao Chen. Currently, I'm interning at IBM Research Cambridge in Boston, so I cannot join the HCI symposium in person. The lightning part I will give is entitled Towards Intern Based User Interface, charting the design space of intern AI intentions across task tabs. Perhaps some of you have never used this interface before, but I'm pretty sure most of you have used this interface, which is ChatGPT. For those two interfaces, the underlying AI model is GPT-3, but so the second interface has much more users compared with the first one because it is easy to use and more accessible to a larger audience. So we can see that the interface plays an important role in the accessibility of AI models. The user interface serves as a platform where humans express their intents to offer task for machine to interpret, execute, and communicate the results back to the users. When we look to the history of user interface, the initial one is a command interface where people use machine language like commands to indicate their intent. For example, open a folder with iOS. Then we have the graphical user interface where people can use direct manipulation, such as double clicking, to open a folder. However, now we go back to the command line like chatbot, like ChatGPT, where it's generally AI in command line. However, we still prefer ChatGPT much more than the command line interface like terminal. Because in the command line interface, we use machine language to express our intents. However, in ChatGPT, 
we use natural language to express human intents. Other way go through the history of mechanisms for people to express their intents. Initially, I mean, even now we use keyboard and mouse, we use tapping and clicking to express our intents to do a task like open a folder. Then later we have smartphones. We can use fingers to operate on a touch screen using touching and gestures to indicate our intents. And now we can just use semantic arms to express our intents. What's the difference between graphical user interface and intent-based user interface? For a graphical user interface, if we want to make a word document looks better, we need to use a very complex toolbar menus to push the button of left of the line or right of the line. However, our real intent is not left of the line. The document intent is makes the document beautiful, ready to present to clients. For graphical user interface, we need to execute process actions. For example, if we want to get a car, we need to operate on the menu bar to set the, the price of a car, the color of a car. However, if we are on an intent-based user interface, we can just express really intense things such as, I want to bust the house. And then the language model could understand our real intent is want to get our car. So this process, first the intent expression, I want to bust the house. Then the language model can interpret our intent as the person is not really want to get a bust house, but is looking for a quick and efficient way to get along. Then that's the uh, intent execution. So do you want to get a car? That's how to get a car. Move the paradigm shape from graphical user interface to intent-based user interface. We need to categorize the type of intent expressions for different types of tasks. For example, for fixed scope content curation tasks, such as news headline generation, maybe one of intent expression will be good enough. However, for more open-date automatic creative tasks, people need to use such intent iterations with setting, rating, and post-editing to polish the results of generative AI to better align with human values. And for more complex and interdependent tasks like the exploratory visual data analysis, there is open space to explore, so we need to use intent exploration, iteration, and sense making to conduct the task. If you have further questions, please feel free to contact me. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Utkarsh, uh, and I'm really excited to share this joint work with graduate student Salmal Sayed Ali and my advisors Elizabeth Bonsignor and Hanisa Kachori, where we explored AI problem formulation with children via teachable machines. Uh, today we are hoping to convince you that designing um, activities that engage children in AI problem formulation is a win-win situation. We can advance both children's AI literacies and help designers and developers better align children's AI values with AI, children's values with AI and use design metaphors that resonate with children. So why problem formulation? Problem formulation is so relevant for, uh, to AI for practitioners and academics that they have advocated it to being as pivotal as learning programming was during the early days of computing. Then, uh, how might we involve children in AI problem formulation? In our work, we approach that uh, we propose that one effective approach is machine teaching. Before providing you some evidence for this, let me explain what is machine teaching. Let's say we want a machine to distinguish between these three types of origami: a dolphin, a dog, or a ghost. You then take a lot of examples for each origami. In this context, Zhu and colleagues define machine teaching as a method that involves a teacher who knows the true thresholds for separating these classes and designs an optimal training set for the learner to learn to classify. In today's talk, children will leverage machine teaching to storyboard their own AI. Uh, children were already exposed to machine teaching uh, prior to the session. They had engaged with the Google Teachable machine as printed in our VLSTC paper and had interacted with I Am Good in a, a museum. In both of these prior activities, they gained familiarity with AI, but they had little pro control over the AI problem, which was to recognize objects. We structured the big paper technique to employ a series of problem reduction heuristics by Volkima in 1983. 
and the storyboard listed key questions as explicit design considerations. The storyboard was used in a larger participatory design session that followed a cooperative inquiry approach. We conducted the session with 10 children aged 8 to 13 years and other core generals from the kids team. In total, we attained 10 storyboards, hours of video and audio recordings, and field notes. Today, I will only provide an overview of our findings. We first analyzed this data for evidence that our activity can contribute to children's AI literacies. We identified the key aspects that characterize children's formulated AI problems. Uh, and we connected this work with that of Long and Magarco's on AI literacy, which was published at CHI. We were surprised to see a high variation among input types uh, that deviated from their prior activities that they had done, with video being the most common. Others included images, speech, and sensor data like accelerometer and pressure. We encourage you to read the paper for more details on different types of outputs, training, and testing strategies that children devised. As a second step, we look into the design metaphors in children's ideas. We build on Schneiderman's seminal work on human-centered AI uh, that calls for greater human control instead of full automation. Uh, we map uh, children's ideas to Schneiderman's four design metaphors, pairs of design metaphors. Let us zoom into one of these pairs, what Schneiderman calls social robots and active appliances. Social robots are humanoid, anthropomorphic, or android robots that have um, that are based on human-like forms or have human-like abilities like emotion recognition, which is in contrast to active appliances that are physical appliances which respond to commands or user-defined rules, such as responding to a voice command or facial recognition. Surprisingly, we find that majority of children, eight out of 10, uh, wanted active appliances and did not anthropomorphize their machines. As a third step, we look into the personal values that children incorporate in their designs. We use the Rokish value survey uh, as an analytical framework to examine the values reflected in children's designs. In terms of Rokish's instrumental values, values that determine the expected behavior of their machines, we found that most children valued capability obedience, responsibility, and helpfulness from their machines, which is similar to values like reliability, safety, and trustworthiness uh, that are commonly discussed in the ongoing discourse in human-centered AI. In terms of Rokish's terminal values, or the preferred end states, which is the goal that children want their machines to solve, to achieve, we found that children wanted their machines to support a comfort comfortable life for them, and expanded the value space to familial connection and harmony, and even excitement. This adds more nuance to discussions about the goal of AI technology and could often be overlooked in existing AI design considerations and ethical debates. In a nutshell, our work contributes a structured storyboarding activity for AI problem formulation, empirical results on how children formulate AI problems, new insights on prevalent AI design metaphors, empirical results on on shared instrumental terminal values in their ideas, novel analytical lenses in AI problem formulation, linking Schneiderman's design metaphors and Rukish's value survey. Uh, coming back to this win-win promise, we see that designers and educators can use our insights to advance AI literacies and align the development of AI technology with users' values and design metaphors that resonate with them. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Si Yi Zhu. Uh, I'm from uh, Co College of Information Studies in University of Maryland. Uh, my advisor is Zhao Cheng, and this is study about hypothetics and the future of augmented sense making. Um, so we all know that, oh, why it's, we all know that uh, scholarly research work always involves like complex, messy, and long-term sense making. This is always results in a very like a temporal, temporal fragmented and a spatial fragmented uh, sense making process. Um, so this is one example of how the sense making work is uh, temporally fragmented. We all see we all see that uh, during our sense making works and research works, there are a lot of like di disruptive environments and the limited uh, capability of memorizing things. So this is one example of people saying that I'm writing things, but I'm also managing people. So multitasking 
and this always causes a second issue. That is, people always have their information artifacts, which is their loads, separated in multiple places. And it makes it hard for people to uh, reuse and retrieve. Let's uh, make an example that we have loads on our load, paper notebooks, but we also have loads annotations on the PDF documents. So we believe that hypertext notebooks can be one solution that to um, scaffold this complex, messy, and long-term sense-making process. So what is hypertext? Hypertext is a type of um, information medium that is structured in terms of loads and bidirectional links, which makes it easier for people to retrieve information, information artifacts and reuse them, especially through this kind of relational databases. So um, this is not something that pretty new. People have already studied since 1980s and 1990s. One, this is one example of like, uh, it's called load cards. This is, it was invented in 1980s uh, about a kind of a personal electronic load books. And this is another example invented by HCL since 1980s. It's called Hypertize. It's also an um, electronic hypertext based load taking like research information management tools. Today, we have more, much more tools. We have Zoom Research, Tana, Obsidian, Noxic. I can name all of them, but they all have one name, Tools for Sorts. So the question is, how do uh, scholars and people really use hypertext to do scholarly sense-making work today? To answer this question, we interviewed 23 researchers. They all have very diverse background and a very like, diverse level of research. 15 of them are using hypertext in their real research works. So what we found, we identified three very specific um, constructs that people used in hypertext loading tools to help them to track in their sense making process and reuse information artifacts they created in the past. So the first example is hubs. Hubs is a type of um, construct that have empty load pages. We, you can see on the top it's a it's empty load pages, and but on the bottom it's a it's a section that listing what other load pages mention these loads. Another example is indices. Indices is a type of um, note pages that lists all, real, all the um, note pages using hypertext. People manually constructed this uh, structure to help them to have centralized places which they can rely on when they are writing their academic papers or doing any other things making and synthesizing tasks. So the last example and that's the constructs that we found is called incubators. Incubators have some kinds of time structures and they could, uh, please note that there's, uh, there's dates and uh, there are also contents within these dates. People are using these dates as a kind of tool for them to track in their uh, sense making states and understanding to what level they understand about this question and to what uh, other kind of evidence they found. So please note all this real text in the contents. They are hypertext. They are hypertext that are linked to another load pages or another uh, other load page about other concepts, other research projects. So people can use it as a reference when they are making sense of things. These three examples are just a part of our findings. We have other more like use patterns and constructs we identified. You can scan this QR code to learn more about our studies. It's a hypertext load book, and it constructs like other, um, it has other like use patterns of how real researchers using hypertext to do research works. So we believe that by discovering these three constructs and other use patterns, it would provide a very um, sufficient insights and uh, um, can help us understanding what could be the design opportunities for future of augmented sense making. So, thank you. <laughs>